from the story of Christ's birth and the role that they had to play with it. And many of them are going to be people who we don't really always think a whole lot about, whose role is maybe not that large, or they don't do a lot of things, or they work in a way that maybe they didn't expect. And as we do that today, I just want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. God, we thank you again for your word. God, and we pray that as we hear from your word today, God, that you would speak to us again. You would just open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to receive what you want to teach us this morning. And God, we pray that you would just receive glory through it. And it's praise on the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So one of the things that is true is that there are dates, there are certain dates that have a lot of significance. And it's because of what we remember on those dates. And one of those dates is actually yesterday, December the 7th. Because on that day, we remember what happened in 1941, which, as I'm sure many of you know, was when the United States was drawn into World War II through the attack at Pearl Harbor. And I remember having a visit with a former member of this church, Bernie Tyson, who was actually at Pearl Harbor when this happened, and being able to talk to him about what he experienced on that day and the way that he just... He helped me understand, even in a deeper way, what it was like to be there on that day as the Japanese planes flew overhead. And they realized all of a sudden that they, instead of just going to have their breakfast, which is what he was doing, they were now on the brink of war. And we're going to be looking this morning at Luke chapter 2. And Luke chapter 2 reminds us of another event that's connected to a date, December the 25th, because Luke chapter 2 is the most complete record we have of the birth of Jesus. As you saw in the slides before worship, there's two places that we read about the birth of Jesus in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. But here in Luke chapter 2, this is the most complete picture we have. There's the most detail. There's the most complete story of what we have. And we're going to be looking at just one piece of this story today. But I hope that as we do that, you get just a little bit clearer picture of what happened. And that as we do that, your appreciation of this incredible event, of this incredible birth that happened over 2,000 years ago grows, just as my experience of Pearl Harbor grew through being able to share with the memories of Bernie Tyson. And to do this, we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verse 7, and this is what it says. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Now, I want to just keep that there for just a second, because my guess is, if you are familiar with the story, you caught something that maybe sounded a little bit different. And it was probably that last line, because this translation that you have here on the screens is from the newest version of the New International Version of the Bible, which is the same version you have in your pews. But in your pews, which is the version right before that, the verse ends this way, because there was no room for them in the inn, which is maybe the way that you've heard it over the years, right? You would recognize the words of this verse, but then you got to that last phrase, and it sounded a little bit different. And that is because there is some translation issues that show up in this seemingly easy verse. And it all has to do with this last piece. It has to do with this last part of the verse about what the writer was actually trying to say. So we're going to look at a few different things this morning from this verse that I think help us understand it. And the first thing is trying to understand what this place was. Because really the issue comes down to this. There's this Greek word, it's called kataluma. I know those look like squiggles to you, but trust me, uh, that's the Greek word kataluma. And it can mean a few different things. It can mean a public inn. So picture like an inn that you're used to, a place that is owned by a business owner that has rooms that can be then rented out for guests, or it can also mean the guest room in a private residence. So again, just keep it here for just a second, because I want you just to think about the difference of these two things. So the first translation options, as I explained, kind of like a public end, like we would kind of know it would be a business, it would be owned by somebody, and it would be designed for guests who are coming into the town to have a place to stay. But in the homes of that day, it was not uncommon to have a guest room available. It would be a place in the home that would be set aside for guests. 
Now, in this particular use of the word, which is used a handful of times throughout the Bible, the most appropriate translation is actually the second one. This probably wasn't actually a public inn. What this probably was, was the guest room of a private residence. So I wanted just to kind of unpack this picture for you just, just a little bit. So homes in that day would have been a, a one-room home. They would have all been contained under one roof. It would have all been in one room. And the guest room that gets talked about would actually be kind of a raised floor portion in the home. So you would have the main part of the home here, and then say over here, there would be a raised floor section, which is where guests would say, and it would also then be used for animals. So they would sometimes have like a manger that would be attached on the wall in there where the animals could go and they could feed, they could drink, but that would also be where their guests would stay when it came to having someone staying with them. And the reason why this matters is this. So I think it gives us a little clearer picture of what was actually going on. So I want you just to picture this for just a minute. Because we always have to try to shake up our memories a little bit. Because usually when I think when we think of a home, we think of the home that we, we live in. But I want you just to picture a one-room home. I want you to picture a one-room home that already has a family living in it. It's probably relatively small in, the, in that they have a small guest portion that maybe is used for the family goat or the family sheep, whatever family animal they may have. And then there's a knock on the door and it's people who are looking for a place to stay. Because I think sometimes we have to be willing to have our picture of the story adjusted a little bit in order to help us see what's going on a little bit more clearly. So I want you just to picture this for a second. Because this wasn't just going to be an ordinary guest that was going to come in to stay in their home. It was a teenage man, a teenage girl who was pregnant, was going to be delivering a baby right there in their home. So they gave them the only space that they would have had, which was that raised floor portion of their home where the guests would stay when they were in town. And in this case, it was open up to strangers who were going to come in. I want you just to think about what that would have been like. As everyone's all kind of there, like they're not like, hey, you go in this separate room over here. Or sometimes we think that the manger or the stable would have been like outside. Well, you kind of go outside to the barn or to the stable. That's really not what would have been going on. They would have been right there in their home with them as they welcome their son into the world. And as, as I think about that, as I was reflecting on that this week, it got me to think about a few other things. It got me to think about what this tells us about Mary and Joseph. Because we know that from the story, Mary and Joseph were there in Bethlehem in order to take part in the census that had been issued. They were asked to go back to their hometown in order to register so they could have an accurate count of the people. So because Joseph was from there, he and Mary went there in order to register, in order to be counted so that way they could be a part of the census. But then as the story says, as we just read, the time came for the baby to be born. So here's what likely would have happened. They would have begun to go from door to door to door to try to find a place for them to stay. And the most likely place they would have gone first would be the public inn, right? If you were going to a new town, if you're going to a place to stay, say for a vacation to visit family, and you weren't going to be staying with family, where would you look to stay? You would first go, you would check if there's a hotel available, something, a place that this is where guests or visitors go to stay. So they would have gone there first. They would have all been filled already due to the census. So what most likely happened next is they would have started to go from door to door to door to try to find somebody who might be willing to take them in. Now, I can't imagine what that would have been like for this young lady who's ready to have a baby. Like, it's time. Like, this is happening. She's in labor. And there she is having to go from door to door to door to try to find a place that's going to open up and to take them in. And it reminds me of what parents will do for their children. I mentioned to you a little bit earlier the significance of dates talked about December the 7th, we talked about December the 25th, but as I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about what parents 
to do for their children. I thought about a different date, and that date is January the 10th, 1962. And my guess is, of all of you here this morning, I doubt there's anybody who can think of something that happened on January the 10th, 1962. But here's what happened on that date. On that date, Richard Eugene Hoyt Jr. was born, and he was born with cerebral palsy. His father, Richard Eugene Hoyt Sr., who was a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. And as he and his wife raised their special needs little boy, one of the things that who came to be known as Dick Hoyt began to do with his son, Rick Hoyt, was run. And what Rick said to his father, Dick, was, when I run, I feel alive. Now, Rick didn't actually run. Rick actually rode in a self-designed kind of a cart that his father, Dick, would push. And they ended up forming what became known as Team Hoyt. Because, you see, the team of Dick and Rick Hoyt, when I say they ran, I don't mean a 5K. My wife and I, we went and we walked the Reason for the Season 5K a couple weeks ago with our two boys. And we kind of joked with people and said, yeah, it's a little bit different when you're pushing like 60 pounds, you know, in a stroller, even though it's 3.1 miles. But Dick Hoyt would take his son Rick, put him in this cart, put him in this kind of adult-sized stroller, and they would do triathlons. They did dozens and dozens and dozens of triathlons. They did marathons. They did all these different races for one simple reason. Because it made his son feel alive. That's why he did it. Into his 70s, he continued to do this. He ran the Boston Marathon in his 70s, pushing his son because of the love that he has for his son. So think about this for just a second with me. Mary and Joseph were already willing to do whatever it took to make sure that their son was going to be safe. And I want you to also to think about with me, I wonder about the impact of that on Jesus when he was told that story. Because one of the things I think happens a lot, isn't it? At, at some point, most children want to talk to their parents about the story of their birth, don't, we, don't they? You know, they want to like, so how, how did this all happen? Like, t t tell me what happened. Like, I, I, I know for me, um, 2.15 in the morning, and I was not very patient. Um, my parents were in the car on the way to the hospital, and there was some legitimate concern for a while. Are we going to get there? Because I was ready. And it wasn't too long after they were at the hospital that, that I was born. But I remember talking to my parents about that story. And I wonder what the impression was on Jesus when Mary and Joseph told him the story of his birth. About going to Bethlehem to register for the census. About going to door to door to door. To try to find a place where they could go in in order to deliver the baby. Because in all this, they had to rely on the kindness of a stranger. Because this, th this innkeeper, he doesn't even have a name. Not even named. It's a stranger in terms of the Bible. In fact, he's not even, even mentioned specifically. We're just left to conclude that there was one because of the place where this happened. So there's this unnamed person who has a role to play in this story who ended up just showing this kindness to Mary and to Joseph. And I think about that innkeeper. Imagine, if you will, you're, you're gathered with your family, times are busy, there's a lot going on, and you get a knock on the door, and then there's this young couple at the door said, is there any way that we could come and we could stay with you? And just remember again, like you don't have like a separate guest room, like upstairs or downstairs. Like They're going to be right there in your house, in that one room with you. But they open up their home, they open up the room, they invite them in to come in and to stay with them, to come in and to deliver the baby. They more than likely would have even probably had to help in this birth process in order to help bring this baby into the world. 
Because I think this person saw something. They saw a person in need. They saw a person who needed hope. One of the things that is loved about this time of year is, is the music, right? Last week, Sunday, we gathered here together and we heard some of that music of the season. We were reminded again of some of these familiar songs. We've sung some of them today. But one of the songs that is so connected with this time of year is the song, O Holy Night, that talks about the night when Jesus was born. But in that song, there's a phrase that says, the thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. And I wonder what that would have felt like for Mary and Joseph to have this homeowner, this innkeeper, say, yes, you can come in. I, I wonder if any frustration had begun to set in. If they were just getting tired of going from door to door, if she's wondering, how long do I have to hold on before I can finally deliver this baby? But then they run into that person who says yes, who says, yes, you can come in. You, you can come in and be in our guest room in order to have your baby. I wonder what changed in their spirit when that happened. I wonder what changed inside them when they were given that thrill of hope, like, we have, we, we're going to have a place. We have a place where we can go. We have a place where we can stay. It may not be much, but it's something. It's a place where we can go to welcome our baby into the world. Because this unnamed person was willing to allow the needs of a stranger, to allow Jesus to mess up their life. It wasn't going to be convenient. It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be without cost. But they were willing to do something inconvenient for the sake of this young couple and their unborn child. And I think about this. Isn't that really what the story of this season is all about? God was willing to do whatever it took to show this world, to show us that we're loved. That's what the season's all about. And what I wonder is, does that bring that thrill of hope to you? Because we've maybe all had times in our life when, when we've needed that, right? When we've needed that bit of hope, we've needed that breath of fresh air, we've needed that wind in our sails. And, and maybe it's shown up in the kindness of a stranger. When somebody just showed up and they, they blessed you in an unexpected way. Maybe it was through a card or a phone call or a visit. Maybe it was the phone call from a prospective employer after a season of unemployment when you would wonder, like, how long am I going to go without work? And then the next job comes. Maybe it's in a season of loneliness that you felt in your life and then somebody came along to bring that companionship, and that joy to your life. Because that's really what this season is all about. And we see it captured just in this one verse out of the story about how through this homeowner was willing to have their life get messed up so that they could show love and compassion and grace to somebody else. And how that baby, as he grew, did the same thing. He went out into the world to minister and to care for people and to give them hope. Because think about what Jesus did in his ministry. Jesus went to the people nobody else wanted to go to. He talked to the people nobody else wanted to hang out with. He went and he cared and he loved for the people that society had left behind. Because he wanted them to know one thing. He wanted them to know that they were loved, that they mattered. That they mattered to Jesus and that they mattered to God. So he went. And he ate in the homes of the tax collectors. He went and he ate in the house of what Scripture calls sinners. He went and he healed the sick. He went and he spent time with the people who would otherwise be ignored. And here's what I think about. This story, as we talked about last week, is still going on. The story of God sharing his love with the world is continuing to go on. And we see this incredible example in this story. I'm, I'm just amazed at the persistence of Mary and Joseph to go and to do whatever they needed to do in order to find a place where they could have a baby. I'm amazed at the hospitality 
of a homeowner to open up their home to welcome a stranger in so that they can have a place to stay. Because we don't know how long they stayed there. We don't know how long they were a guest in this person's home. But we know that it was done so that they could have a safe place to come and to deliver their baby. So I wonder, are there ways that God wants to maybe have our lives be a little bit messed up or a little bit inconvenient so that we can show God's love to somebody else? Or is there a way that God maybe wants to mess up your life a little bit to remind you that you're loved? Because here's one of the things I'm convinced of. Sometimes I think we can maybe lose some of the beauty of this story the more times we hear it. Like th Think back maybe to the first time you heard the story, if you can remember. What you felt, what you experienced when you realized that God loved you. Because I'm convinced that I don't think that feeling is supposed to go away. But the way that we recover that thrill of hope in our lives is by continuing to allow God to work in our lives. So, does the way that God maybe wants to do this in your life look like joining one of our life groups that are starting? Does it look like maybe finding a way to bless someone this year, whether it's through something like the angel tree, maybe it's through going to serve somewhere as a family. You decide we're going to go serve together at a soup kitchen. We're going to go find a place where we can go serve together. Maybe, maybe we're just going to go out and we're going to go caroling through our neighborhood together. Maybe our family and another family, we're going to go and we're going to do that. But to find some way that you can go and you can bless people to let them know that they are loved. Because that's really the ongoing story of this season is that God so loved the world that he sent his son. So as you sit here today, I want you just to hear two things. I want you to hear that you are so loved that God would do whatever he needed to do to make sure that you would know that you're loved. And I hope and I pray that that never, ever loses the impact on you. To know that the God of heaven loves you. And there's nothing that he wouldn't do to show you his love. Do we look at the example of this unnamed person from years ago and think, is there a way that God wants me to show love to somebody? I had the opportunity this week to go out and to visit some different people from our church, as I mentioned earlier in the prayer time. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm amazed at how many times when I go on these visits, people tell me how blessed they are by the visits, the phone calls, the cards, the well wishes that they receive from members of this church, from other friends, from members from the community. It really makes such an incredible difference. So I just want to encourage you with this. It's a way that you maybe want to do that. If you know somebody who's going through a difficult time health-wise, if you know somebody who's maybe just in a challenging season of life, would you even consider just simply just writing them a card, making a phone call, offering to, to bring by maybe a meal, whatever their needs may be. In doing that, we remind people that they are loved. We remind people that they matter. And we're doing this exact work that Jesus started so many years ago by coming into the world. Because in doing that, as they feel the love that they can receive from friends, from strangers, from church members, whoever it may be, they can be reminded again that they too are so loved by God that they matter. And I wonder this. Can we have that same persistence that Mary and Joseph would have had? We're will they were willing to do whatever it took for their baby, even though they didn't fully understand what he was going to become quite yet. We think of that bond that parents have with their children and what they will do to make sure that their child are safe and loved. I wonder if we would be willing to take on that same drive, that same energy, that same passion as we share the message of hope this Christmas season. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you that, God, that you love us, that you, you care for us, God, that you have nothing that you would not do in order to remind us, God, that we're loved. 
So God, as we gather here today, God, may we know that we are so deeply loved by you. God, that there's nothing that you wouldn't do to remind us of your love. And God, that we would look for those opportunities that we have to go and to share that love with others. God, that we would just be able just to go and to bless people, not only this Christmas season, God, but through our lives. It might just be through slowing down enough just to share a kind word with somebody as we're buying our groceries. That we might just take time just to write a card to someone who's in need, God, that we might find some way to share your love this season, and that in doing that, we too would be reminded how loved we are by you, Lord. We pray this on the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you please join me in our closing song, He Has Come For Us. Mary, gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. As we close tomorrow, I just want to ask you just to open up your hands in front of you to receive this blessing as we close our service today. May you know the love of God who sent his son into the world that you might have life. May you know the grace that is yours because of Jesus Christ. And may you know the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in your life today and forevermore. Amen.